Good morning, church. It's good to be here today. For all of you who are listening and tuning to this online, glad to be able to at least see you virtually like this. I can't actually look at you, but you can see me. But I hope that if you have your Bible with you, grab it and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, where we're going to be continuing on in our Sermon on the Mount series. Our message today comes from just one verse. Let's read it together. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The verse that I've just read today is one of the most well-known verses or proverbs in our culture. Now, the words golden rule aren't actually found in scriptures, even though you might see them as a little heading in your Bible. It's not part of the text. And it's possible that the name came from the third century Roman emperor named Alexander Severus, who wrote it basically on his palace walls and also the walls of public buildings. Uh, Severus himself was not a Christian, but these words had made such a huge impact on them that he basically made it his own personal motto uh, for life. And therefore, he uh, was actually quite kind to Christians during his time. Now, whether you're a secular or whether you're a religious person, there's no question that the golden rule really feels just right. And there's a sense of rightness and goodness and appropriateness about it. It makes sense without a lot of explanation. In fact, I read about how a British TV studio some, I don't know, a couple of years ago, 2005, I think it was, yes, yeah, surveyed some 44,000 people in an attempt to create a new set of Ten Commandments. And it's really interesting. Guess what the response was? You know, what is it that people chose to be the number, command, number one commandment if they had to rewrite it? And it was this, basically the golden rule, do unto others, treat others as you would want to be treated. Now, what's interesting is that if you think about this, despite the fact that some 99% of people would uh, agree and feel like it's right. And probably the vast majority of those 99% who would agree with it would also say that, yeah, they do try to live by the golden rule. The question, of course, is how is that possible? Especially considering that our world today is still filled with pain and bloodshed. And the question for us is, how is that possible if really we are living by this and this is what people say that they actually believe? You know, part of the reason why I think there's this problem is because our North American sin tendency actually results in us grossly overestimating our own goodness, intelligence, competence, and you name it, basically, and so on. And you can see this, for example, like in a survey that was done of the University University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and they found there that 94% of their faculty rated themselves as being above average in their teaching ability. Now, I found another stat that also said that some 80% of people think that their driving skills are above average. I mean, you could go on with this, but do you see the point? The point is that, especially for us North Americans, there is a significant disconnect between what we think we are and what we actually are. You know, Stephen Hine is a psychologist at the University of British Columbia right here. And he has noted that research shows this, that Westerners have a strong need to view themselves in positive terms. The vast majority of North Americans score above the theoretical midpoint of self-esteem scales. They report unrealistically positive views of themselves and engage in various compensatory, self-protective responses when confronted with threats to their self-esteem. So, in short, what he's saying is that we North Americans think way too highly of ourselves and we get really mad when somebody tells us that we do. See, and unless you realize this, actually, you, you will actually never be able to receive criticism and to change for the better. And whether, whether that's your boss talking to you or God talking about your spiritual life, the end result is the same. You just get mad. You think, I'm fine. I'm okay. I don't need anybody's opinion. I've got a pretty good head on my shoulders here. Now, the truth is, although many of us think that we live actually by the golden rule and we uh, preach it as well, 
I think it's actually very unlikely that we do, given what the golden rule actually is. Let me reread this verse again, and we'll begin to unpack this bit by bit. Okay. Verse 12 again. The text says, So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You see, the language that Jesus uses here is very simple and it is strong. And he says, what you want others to do for you, that's what you are going to do for other people. So you do that to them. And then Jesus actually makes a monumental statement here using the word for. And by for, what he means is that if you do this, if you do to others what you would have them do unto you, this is, a, a, this is connecting or you're fulfilling the message of the law and the prophets or the Old Testament. In other words, he's saying there is something about what you do here. If you live this way, that you fulfill the scriptures. Now, I'll have to unpack that later a bit more, but just hold that for a moment. Now, I know that some people have argued that the golden rule is not unique to Jesus and that it's found in other cultures and so on. Okay, so there are some examples that are similar, I would say, to this. For example, Isocrates, a famous Greek rhetorician, said this, What stirs you to anger when done to you by others, do not do to others. Jewish Rabbi Hillel said, Do not do to your neighbor what is hateful to you. This is the whole Torah and the rest of the commentary. Rest is commentary. Chinese philosopher Confucius said, What you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. See, okay, do you know what's common to all of these? And the answer to that is that they're all framed in the negative. See, it's all do not as opposed to do. And this negative form of the golden rule is the one that's more common, and in fact even has a name, and it's often called actually the silver rule. Now the question that we need to ask is, is there actually a difference between the silver rule and the golden rule? And the answer to that is actually yes there is. And though they're very similar, and we can find examples of the silver rule in antiquity, there's a huge difference because the effect of it I think is very, very different. See, the silver rule is something that can actually be codified into law. And you can actually force people to live according to it. It's actually very easy to make a law that says, for example, don't steal or commit adultery, you know, don't murder. And then you jail people who actually do such a thing. In fact, I would say that because of sin in this world, this kind of law is actually essential and necessary to have in a fair and just society that is orderly, ordered properly so that evil cannot run rampant and flourish and is properly restrained. But the golden rule that Jesus talks about here is not simply a negative, it's actually about positive action. And, with that, and positive action is not something that you could compel by using the law. So for example, you will never find in Vancouver a law that says, Thou shalt love thine co-worker. See, a police officer will never arrest you because your co-worker filed a complaint against you to say, I don't think so-and-so loves me very much. And they drag you into the interrogation room and they say, is that actually true? Are you guilty of not loving your co-worker in there? We received a very serious complaint about this. See, the golden rule actually prohibits, I mean, includes a prohibition on all the things that are wrong, the things that we shouldn't do. But it also includes action on right things that we should do and engage in. The silver rule really can be fulfilled by like the Disney princess sleeping beauty. So you don't even have to be awake to fulfill the silver rule. As the silver rule is about not doing bad things to other people. See, so long as you don't even get up from your bed and you're not hurting anyone else in the process, you can actually fulfill that rule. But the golden rule is so different because the golden rule can't be fulfilled in that way. The golden rule demands activity. Now, unfortunately, I think that the silver rule is actually closer to what the majority of us Canadians actually live by. And you can actually see it in our sort of apologetic, typically Canadian speech. 
If, for example, we don't say, excuse me, could I use the bathroom here? More often than not, I hear Canadians saying something like this, uh, hi, I'm sorry, but excuse me, sorry, sorry to bother you, but, but would it be okay for us to, to borrow your bathroom? You know, if you, if you just stop and you think about that kind of speech, you realize just how hilarious it is coming out of the mouths of Canadians. A sentence does not need two sorries and an excuse me. Also, no one borrows a, a bathroom and returns it like 15 minutes later. I mean, we use this sort of language because in our understanding of the culture and the way that we talk, we do our very best to try to not be imposing whatsoever. And so we talk this way. You know, I actually never really realized this about ourselves until, us, until I hosted an American friend who came to live with me for two weeks. And he said that he loved how my wife's favorite word seems to be sorry. And, and so he actually uh, tried hilariously for the rest of his trip to insert the word sorry into his, into his speech, wanting to know he was saying it right, you know, when he would when he could use it. I just found it so amusing, right, to, to hear him commenting on the way that we talk. You know, it was interesting because I read an article by Emily Keller entitled, Sorry, Can We Talk About Why Canadians Apologize So Much? And she told a story about how she was almost hit by a truck. And as her, the Canadian driver rolled down the window and yelled out to her, Sorry, she instinctively yelled back, Sorry, as well, even though she was actually angry, for about just about being run over. She thought to herself, why did I just say that? It's just such a part of the way that we talk. Now, I think part of the reason for why that's so is because we as Canadians generally define ourselves by what we are not. So we are not American, we are not bigoted, we are not assertive, we are not racist, and so on. And when somebody is upset with us, that's not our intent, intent actually to offend anybody in the process. So we say things like, sorry. Now, I think the very definition of what it means to have a good life as a Canadian is quite different from the American definition. I think the Canadian definition is more like, uh, I believe that you should live out your dreams. Just make sure you don't hurt anybody in the process. To me, I think that's the Canadian good life. You know, also as Canadians, you know, we, because of this, you know, you know, this, this feel, this sense as well that we don't want to hurt anyone, it really plays itself out in the way that actually we think. And of course, the way that we communicate as well. Now, I don't think that's a bad thing for us to be sensitive to others. In fact, I think that many people in our world could use a sense of sensitivity and kindness that Canadians have. However, I want to also say that nobody ever did something great by simply refraining from activity. The great social activists and the political activists of the past are all known by the activity and the things that they have done for the good of people in the world. You know, as Canadians, we need to be careful about thinking that we are great when we primarily maybe live lives that are about obeying the silver law. Now, our fellow Canadians might actually applaud us and say, yes, you have done well in life by living by the silver law. But the truth of the matter is that God's standard is not the silver law. God's standard is the golden rule for us as believers. God calls us to godly activity, not just from refraining from bad activity. In Matthew 25, verse 41, we actually see this as Jesus demonstrates by speaking to the goats the importance of this. He says in Matthew 25, verses 41 to 46, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. See, here's the deal. The silver rule can make you drive your car safely so that nobody dies. But the silver rule will never compel you to stop your car to care for someone who is dying. 
Do you see the difference there? Huge difference. Now, just to be clear, the silver rule, though many of us, I think, live by it, especially in Canada, isn't the only competing philosophy that is out there in life. There's actually a humorous alternative to the golden rule. And it says, whoever has, the golden rule means, whoever has the gold makes the rules. Now, in other words, this means might makes right, right? It's although also known as the iron rule. You got enough money, you got enough power, you rule over other people. And perhaps some of you listening to this have lived or are living this way right now. You wield your seniority in your company, your wealth, your position of power, your high status like a club, and you use it actually to compel other people to do your will, simply because you're stronger than them. You know, the truth of the matter is, this kind of Darwinian practice is incompatible with being a Christian. As Christians, in order to be great, we must become the least and the servants of all. We serve a Lord Jesus Christ who became poor, even though he was rich, for our sake, so that we, by his poverty, could become rich. Though Jesus himself could have commanded on the cross 12 legions of angels to come to his defense, he chose not to exercise his power and to use his might and glory, but instead chose to suffer and die on that cross so that he could save us from our own sins and rescue us. See, the love of God drove him to do so for the glory of his Father. See, the iron rule is not only animalistic, but it's an affront to God. And if you live like that, you do not live according to the will of God. Here's here's another one that's colloquially called this, perhaps the anti-golden rule, or sometimes known as the children's version of the golden rule. And it reads like this, Do unto others before they do unto you. And it works like this, okay? This is how the logic goes. Premise one, the child's mind. Lego blocks are so fun. Premise number two, other kids like having fun. Logical connection at that point. Conclusion, other kids will take the Lego blocks in order to have fun. Therefore, light bulb goes off in their head, I had better take them first. Now, you could see this thought process in kids all the time as well, how they do this, you know, whether it's at daycare or in your home, fighting with their siblings or so on. But the same thing actually applies to us as adults. For example, during COVID-19, premise number one, hand sanitizer protects us from COVID. Premise number two, the amount of hand sanitizer is limited in the midst of a pandemic. Conclusion. Hand sanitizer will sell out in the midst of the pandemic. Therefore, light bulb moment, I better go out and do it first. That's how we think. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong in wisely stocking up provisions and collecting things for ourselves. There's prudence in doing so. But doing this in such a way that your neighbor is harmed and you hoard to the exclusion of the benefit of other people It's not only uncharitable, it's unbiblical. Now, that's the proactive version of this rule. I I have to say there's also a reactive version of this, uh, this rule. And that is, do unto others as they have done already to you. In other words, this is called get revenge. Again, this is not godly. You know, the Bible teaches us that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. We are not to take matters into our own hands. Think about if Jesus Christ had avenged himself on those soldiers who crucified him on that cross, you and I would still be dead in our sins and trespasses without hope and wandering without God in this world, doomed to an eternity in hell because of our sins. We are so glad that Jesus Christ did not repay evil with evil, but repaid evil with good. So as children of grace, we cannot live selfishly in our lives. We cannot live by an anti-golden rule. There's another one, let me give this to you, that our culture also preaches and that I have called the boomerang rule. And that is, do unto others and eventually it will come back to you. Now, I know what this means. It's kind of like, hey, in a positive sense, what goes around that's good actually comes back to you and will benefit for you. You pay it forward and hey, you'll get a good thing returned to you in the end of the day. You know, the problem with this is that one, it's not always necessarily true. And the second thing is that it's about 
ultimately selfish and personal gain. In other words, if you're not careful with this, it can actually turn people into tools. I serve you only because I hope to get something back from you. And if you cease to be useful to me, therefore I stop serving you. If you can't give me what is beneficial, I will actually perhaps have to discard you. And again, my point is Christians cannot live this way. We can't. You know, Jesus, speaking about this in Luke chapter 14, verse 13, said to his disciples, When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. See, God demands that we give and give, not just to people who can repay us, but that we give to those who can't repay us, and that is part of his will. See, the golden rule is not me-focused, but it's actually others-focused. It's not vengeful, but it's loving. The golden rule is not about getting, but it's about giving. It's not about might, but it's about empowering others. It says, do good regardless of how they treat you, how they think about you, or what they do for you in return. See, the golden rule shows you practically how to carry out the second and greatest commandment, that is to love your neighbor as yourself. What it does for us is that it concretizes this abstract concept of love and shows you actually how to live it out. See, if you only have the law and you don't have love, let me show you what happens with how you read the law. Look at Exodus 23, verses 4 to 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, You shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Now, imagine that you're a believer, let's say in the silver rule or the iron rule or the boomerang rule or the anti-golden rule or one of these other sort of laws and not the golden rule. And, And you saw your enemy's sheep being attacked, let's say, by a wolf. And the love of God does not live in your heart. You could say, well, that sheep is not lost, nor is it lying down under a burden. Therefore, according to the law, I actually have no legal obligation to go and rescue that sheep. In fact, it's kind of dangerous as well. Why should I get myself involved? But Do you know what the difference is? Is If you live by the golden rule and the love of God saturates your heart, you'll read the law differently. You will read this and you will say, he is my enemy. But God has put love for him inside my own heart. If that were my sheep, I would actually save it. And to do for him, to do for others what I would have done for myself, I need to act. I will save his sheep because I know what what the law of love demands of me. See, God's God's law was never meant to be read in this legalistic, minimalistic fashion. It was never meant to be taken as a checklist of legalistic commands that could be rearranged, dragged out from this letter to turn into a ladder that you use to climb your way to heaven and to earn yourself a place amongst the righteous. No, when the law speaks about things like adultery, murder, stealing, and so on, these are just illustrations of practically what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. See, you can't say, I love my neighbor while trying to steal his wife, his life, or his bank account. Right? You can't do that. See, sin drives us to chop up God's law, basically into this kind of ladder that we want to climb to get to heaven on our own, rather than seeing the law of God as markers that actually point us to the ultimate fulfillment of the law, and that is the work and person of Jesus Christ himself, the love of God that we see embodied in his life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection. That's what the law was for. And only when we understand the law of God through the lens of the love of God will we actually know how to rightly interpret it. Let me just say that the law of love is far superior to a law book full of, let's say, 1,000 rules. And the reason why is because 1,000 rules is not enough to help you deal with the hundreds of thousands of decisions that you will be faced with in your lifetime. 
A law book of that thickness is not enough to help you navigate the issues of life. But if you understand the law of love, that is God's love, you will actually have a surer guide throughout all of your life, especially as you go through some of the most difficult and challenging circumstances. The law of love will help you with this. See, the golden rule actually summarizes God's ethic for his people in the law and in the prophets, which is a shorthand basically for the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures. I think this is how Jesus is using the phrase here. And he uses it in another place similar like this when he teaches the men on the Emmaus Road about how the scriptures actually prophesied and predicted the Christ's death and resurrection. Luke 24 verse 27 says this, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, in this text, when Jesus says Moses, Moses is, is a synonym for the law. So what he's saying here is the law and the prophets. And he says that since he's interpreting all of the scriptures here, it's clear that, that the way he's using the law and the prophets is to uh, be a shorthand for referring to the entirety of the Old Testament. So why in our text does Jesus want us to do good to others, to do to others what we would have them do to us. The answer to that is in our text. For this actually fulfills the essence of God's ethic for his people, which is a summary of the entire Old Testament. That's why the golden rule is so golden. And the so, or therefore, in some of the translations of the Bibles at the beginning of our text, actually implies that the golden rule is the culmination of all that Jesus has taught, I think, in the Sermon of the Mount up to this point so far. Going all the way back to actually 517, where Jesus comes and says, I didn't come to abolish the law, I actually came to fulfill it. So everything in the Sermon on the Mount shows you actually how to read the heart of the law and not just read the letter of the law. That's why Jesus ends up talking about this after and saying it's not just about committing adultery. It's about actually not having lust in your heart. It's not just about being not, not angry, but I mean, uh, not murdering, but actually not having anger in your heart as well. It's about the conscience and what's going on inside yourself. It's not just about refraining from sin. It's not about just, um, praying, giving, and fasting, you know, but actually making sure that your motives are pure. Don't do these things in order to gain the approval of other people, but you should do them because you actually love God and you want His praise and not rather to use God as a tool to get praise from people who think you're great and spiritual because of what you do. See, why would anybody want to do such things like praying, fasting, and giving in secret? And the answer to that is because they actually love God and they want to honor God and God is at the forefront of their thoughts. See, only God's love can empower you to live the golden rule. See, and even a baby Christian who knows very little about the Bible but understands the supreme ethic of love, understands the love of God demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ, will, for the large part of life, have a solid understanding of what should be done in many of the difficult circumstances that they face, if only they understand love. And this is exactly, I think, what the scriptures affirm. You read, for example, Galatians 5, verses 13 to 14, and it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through the love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, Paul is saying, I know you're free, brothers, and you have a lot of freedom to do different things, but guess what? You are called to love and to serve one another, and you fulfill that whole law if you have love at the center of it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You figure out how to do that, 95% of the time, you will figure out what to do. Your brothers and sisters, you know, in, in, in one sense, God has made it simple for us to understand the heart of the matter, our heart attitude, what we should have in the depths of our very own being as we meet with difficulties and trials. 
Now, this is not to say that knowing your Bible is unimportant. It's actually very important to know the scriptures because there are situations that you need to know very specifically what to do. But the heart of the matter is this, that we must have the love of God in our souls. Just think about what delights you in your own heart, what you would want other people to do for you that isn't sinful, and then, generally speaking, go and do that for somebody else. You know, the businessman who lives quietly and joyfully donates half the profits from his business is living out the golden rule, to the poor and the needy, is living out the golden rule. The friend who spends day after day, week after week, calling the depressed, those who are downtrodden, those who are in difficult times, just to encourage them, really shines really with the golden light of God's law. It is the breastfeeding mother of a tiny little infant who's so sleep deprived that she can barely, uh, think, let alone open up her Bible and read its pages, she is one who can still honor the golden rule by trusting God to help her to be patient and to be kind, to love her children, the rest of her children, and to love her husband, and to be a model as well for others in the midst of suffering. You know, a little child can fulfill this golden rule as long as they understand that as they're making little bookmarks to encourage other people and giving them out in Jesus' name because they want to honor God, I mean, they can also shine and gleam with golden light. And for all those who do this and live this way, this is the promise that we have for us. Our King will one day say, Matthew 25, verses 34 to 40, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Our Lord is saying to your brothers and sisters, you be faithful with your talents and with your very life and you live a life that is filled with the love of God and you will shine like the stars. You may not be a clever teacher, you may never get up and preach a sermon, but if your life gleams with the gold of the golden rule, people will be able to read God's word from your life. Now, I love the story that's told about W.H. Smith, who was a politician in the 1800s. And his secretary, Mr. Wilson, wondered why he often would pack his heavy papers with him instead of mailing them, as was the practice of many other uh, ministers at the time. And Mr. Smith looked at his secretary and said to him, Well, my dear Wilson, the fact is this. Our postman who brings the letters from Henley has plenty to carry. I watched him one morning coming up the approach with my heavy pouch in addition to his usual load, and I determined to save him as much as I could. Church, that's love. See, the law will tell you what the legal limit is for how much you can add to another person's burden. But only love will drive you to actually share that burden with them. See, friends, the silver rule does not require faith actually to live by. You can sleep and fulfill the silver rule. But the golden rule can only truly be fulfilled and live by the power of God that comes through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ so that you can give it all away. See, only the message of God's love through the Christ's death on the cross for sinners like you and me. Only the forgiveness of our sins and knowing that we are recipients of grace upon grace and that we don't deserve any of this can actually melt our hearts of stone and drive us to be a people who are known for our love and good works and who can pour ourselves out for service to other people in the same way that the Lord poured himself out and spilled his own blood for us. You will love the unlovable, because you will realize that you who were once unlovable were loved by God. You can dispense grace freely because you will recognize that you were a recipient of the free grace of God. You can give costly things to other people because God gave you the costly gift of his own son. You will never stop searching for lost sheep 
and chasing after souls to serve, leaving behind the 99 to go and search for others because that is exactly what God lived, did for you. Who are you to deserve the love of God? And yet did the master not choose you for his own to allow you to know his grace, to open your eyes to your own sin and to free you from the shackles of your bondage so that you could live a life of love for him? He did it all for you. How could you not in gratitude want to serve him in the same way? It's a joy for you to be able, even though it's tough, to pick up your cross daily, to embrace your suffering and deny yourself. And as you walk and feel bowed down by the weight of your cross and your head tips forward, you can see the footsteps of your master in the dirt of the road up ahead. And your eyes and heart will be directed forward and upwards and be treated to a greater and greater vision of the heavenly city that lies just beyond the horizon of the end of your life, that becomes more and more crystal clear as the days go by, encouraging your heart. See, until you can say, the old me is dead, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me, you will never truly be able to live the golden rule. Only one who has completely died to self and has been born again can truly live for God and to live for others. You know, all of you who are listening to me today, friends, I want to ask you, what rule have you been living by? See, is it a silver rule that says do no harm and to other people? Is it, is it perhaps an iron rule that says might makes right and you've lived exercising your power over other people? Perhaps you've been living according to the anti-golden rule that says get them before they get me. Or the boomerang rule that says, uh, give so that I can actually get from others. Do, do you want to be free? You want to know the joy of living the golden rule, of giving it all away. Do you want to know what it feels like to experience what Jesus said? It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the first thing you need to do is to turn from your sins and come to Jesus. Believe on him for salvation. Believe in the gospel. Trust in him. Understand that Christians, we are called to live lives of love. And as we do so, may God see it fit to make us shine like the stars in heaven as we pour out our lives into active service for other people, thinking of others first. You know, the last week has been a whirlwind of activity for me. And ever since we released the open letter to Bonnie Henry, I have spent countless hours just going through my email inbox, my Facebook, and my phone have been flooded actually with messages from lawyers, doctors, pastors, politicians, and from average Christians from all walks of life. And all these little notes that I've been sent are actually immensely encouraging to me. As of last night, Saturday, February 20th, Facebook and YouTube had a combined total of 16,000 views in nine days. And I'm honestly very grateful to all of those who have thrown in their support, whether pastors or people in the pews. But I know that some of you are actually curious as to why I wrote the open letter now. And the truth of the matter is, I actually felt compelled to. I felt that the word of God was in me like a fire, in my bones, and that though I'd actually been writing and rewriting since November, that burden actually increased so greatly that I actually had trouble sleeping, had trouble functioning anymore, couldn't focus. I could no longer handle hearing the cries of pain from God's people in B.C., including in our own church that are caused by these lockdowns that have caused, I think, the spiritual starvation of God's people by disallowing them to gather, to pray together, to study God's word together, and to be able to worship God on Sundays together under any circumstances. I mean, how can I watch people pouring into pubs to drink alcoholic spirits. When God's people are spiritually parched and dry and dehydrated, poor children who can't even have a 
drink of the living water that comes through the Spirit of God. You know, when the last lockdown was extended indefinitely, I just felt like I no longer had any choice. If I did not move from just praying to praying and doing, I would be sinning against God by denying my talents and burying them in the ground and living by the silver rule rather than the golden rule. The church of Jesus Christ actually needs to gather to fulfill her function as a living temple, as the body of Christ, as a pillar of the truth. You know, God has trust and trusted to us the precious remedy against the terminal disease of sin, which if left unchecked will kill people, kill souls for all of an eternity. You know, my conscience feels the weight of my obligations to God so that I'm willing to become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. At the same time, it is my sincere desire for my ministry to be conducted in a way that is God-honoring so as to avoid giving any unnecessary offense to people through my speech and my conduct. You know, few people actually understand what pastors have done in this pandemic. And I'm certain that if any pastors are listening to this as well, that what I say will resonate with you. You know, throughout this pandemic, I have worked with those who have battled anxiety and depression, domestic conflicts, unemployment, and the list goes on and on and on. I have personally hand-delivered food to the needy in my own neighborhood here. I've opened up my toolbox to assist single mothers and others who were in need of simple repairs in their own homes. I've used my engineering skills to set up communication solutions for those who were stuck in hospitals and had no way for anyone to visit them as a result of the COVID restrictions. I've mopped the sweat-beaded brow of a drug addict struggling and through the pain of withdrawal as I cared for him. I have prayed with and supported a Christian health worker who contracted COVID-19 because she refused to actually stop caring for elderly COVID-19 patients. And though she was so sick and all of her non-Christian colleagues were afraid to go into work, the only thing that she could think of was wanting to get better so that she could go right back to work, right back into the thicket of the war zone so that she could care for those whom other people were wanting to abandon. I met with and counseled a young man who wanted to meet with me because he was afraid to die as COVID spread throughout the lower mainland. And though we met outside with masks and sit, sitting six feet apart, this did not stop God's word from working, and he found peace and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and was baptized into our church family. And you know who I'm talking about, church. You know, I could go on and on and on about stories like this. I I wrote publicly because I knew that many had written and that the majority had received no response. I wrote, wrote church because I knew, I know that how essential gathering is for many of you who are listening to me today. Some of you have just moved here literally to be a part of our church and the church family is your only family that you have. Others of you are actually walking through trauma and depression and very difficult times right now. And all you want and all you need is actually to stand in the presence of other believers. In the body of Christ, that is with all of each other, just, just to be encouraged and to be reminded about how great and awesome our God is and He sees you in your troubles right now and He loves you. That's all you want. And it breaks my heart, actually, to see you isolated like this. Gathering together is essential for all of you and all those like you who are languishing 
and suffering in the hundreds of churches that are scattered across this province. That's why I've written, Love of Jesus Christ compels me. And it's my prayer that other shepherds would also rise up and stand with me for the sake of God's people and the love that they have for their flock. You know, I haven't heard anything back from Dr. Henry in these last 10 days, nor do I know how to have an audience with her. But if I could speak to her, I would say this. Dr. Henry, please do not force me to choose between public health and the spiritual health of my people, which is no less important. While you attend to the health of my people's people's bodies, let me treat the spiritually sick and dying with the medicine that they need. Sometimes something as simple as being together will heal a sick soul. As my letter states, our church has always been committed to following rigorous safety protocols to support your goals and ours of protecting public health. The fact that you have created rules to allow many non-religious gatherings in our province demonstrates that it is possible to meet safely. And now, please help us to do God's will. And please create for us similar safety rules and regulations for us to be able to meet safely together to alleviate the sufferings of our members and our community. That's what I would say. Church, we are called to be a people who are devoted to good, who live by the golden rule according to the power of God that comes through His Son, Jesus Christ. And no matter what the circumstances are, church, right now, I know that our God is sovereign and that He rules over this pandemic right now, even here in B.C. And I know that He hears His children's cries. So church, I want to encourage you today, even as you have written in and encouraged me, have hope. Have hope in a sovereign God who rules over kings, governments, and people everywhere, and over human history itself. Have hope in this God whose steadfast love never fails. He who has saved us from the jaws of sin and death will deliver us even now as we call on Him and wait on Him. The question for us today is can we trust Him as we live? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you so much, God, for this text. Thank you for the joy that's found in Jesus Christ and how sweet his gospel is. How much you love us, God, to give us such a simple law of love to live by that everyone from the greatest scholar to a child can actually understand. And by so doing, God, live a life that is rich, transforms the lives of people around us and even the world. Father, I beg and I pray now, for pastors everywhere, that they would not give up praying, not give up shepherding, that they would love their people even through this. I pray, Father, for our our BC health officials and all of our political leaders in BC. Give them wisdom, Lord. Grant us favor as well. Make a way so that your people might gather once again and help us, O God, as a people, to be winsome, gracious in our speech, gentle as doves, wise as serpents. Help us, O God, to have joy as we live proactively, doing good, living by the golden rule. Would you allow us to be a blessing to a world that is struggling with godly Christian activity? I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name, that the love of Christ compel us. Amen.